So I think we're going to get started. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming. Hello out there. The great mass is watching us via remote. Uh, we're here today to listen to a lecture by the Earl Pellerin Traveling Fellowship winner. I guess Earl Pellerin Traveling Fellowship winner. Uh, and today, tonight's going to be a little bit different from our normal lecture series in that it's more than just a lecture. We're going to have a lecture, and then afterwards, we're going to announce the nominees and the winner of this year's Pellerin Fellowship Award. And then we have a reception ready to go in the Brick Gallery of the Old Architecture Building, which is a display of Emily's work from this fellowship. So please, I hope you can join us for all these events and, and stick around. It should be pretty good. Uh, so the reason that we're here is the Earl Pellerin Traveling Fellowship, which was created by the architecture cabinet of the COAD architecture cabinet of the LTU alumni in honor of Earl Pellerin, who's really the godfather of architecture here at LTU. Uh, he was a faculty member for over 40 years. He was the first dean of the architecture school, and he designed the engineering building and the old architecture building. So we're living with his legacy on a daily basis. But uh, at some point, the architecture cabinet decided that they wanted to honor uh, Pellerin by creating a fellowship in his name. They thought it would be appropriate to make it a traveling fellowship, since Earl Pellerin was trained back in the old school Ecole de Beaux-Arts method and really believed, uh, like a lot of people back then and a lot of people even today, that traveling is an important part of the education of any architect and any opportunity that you have to go out and see buildings you should take advantage of. And so they were gracious enough to establish an annual award for a graduate student uh, that we've carried on until today. So what we're going to do tonight is listen to last year's Pellerin Fellow, Emily Matt. And then afterwards, as I said, I'll announce the nominees for the 2018 uh, Pellerin Fellowship and the winner. Uh, and then we'll go and have our, the re our reception. So to introduce Emily, I'm going to introduce Nicole Giroux, who is the... What's your title, actually? Chair of the COAD. The chair of the COAD Architecture Cabinet of the LTU alumni. <laughs> I think I got that right. Uh, please welcome Nicole. She's only for the far end. Okay, sorry. Sorry for everyone who's listening. <laughs> I just have to, a couple times. Um, so thank you, Dale. As Dale just mentioned, I'm Nicole Giroux, and I am the chair of the COAD Alumni Committee um, of the Alumni Association. We're actually the only college that has their own cabinet, which is pretty cool. Um, and what we're made up of nine COAD alumni volunteers who serve three-year terms. And our goals are to provide initiatives to which support ongoing development and success of our alumni and for you to stay involved with the college and the community as alumni as well. So if you're looking to get involved, shameless plug here, if you're looking to get involved at all, our elections happen in May, so at the end of the semester. So for those of you who are going to be new alumni, congratulations, but please get involved as well. Uh, it's, it's a rewarding experience to be able to um, give back to the college and the future growth uh, of the university. So, end of my shameless plug. <laughs> the Pellerin Award is one of our two annual award initiatives each year, and we believe that it supports our goals and that it's both my cabinet's, mine, excuse me, it's both mine and the cabinet's pleasure to introduce Emily Matt, who is the 2017 Pellerin Award winner. Emily currently works as a project manager at Lab Architects and is working on her architectural license. She graduated from Lawrence Tech University with her BS in architecture in 2014 and her M Arc in 2016. She was named the valedictorian of her M Arc graduating class and received the AIA Medal for Excellence in the Study of Architecture as well as the ARCC King Medal for Excellence in Architectural and Environmental Research. Her interest in Brazil Baroque architecture is due to her experiences living in Brazil for three years, where she had the opportunity to travel to multiple cities and see architecture firsthand. She is a member of the Society of Architectural Historians and has attended annual conferences in 2015 and 2016. 
She's also had the opportunity to present at the Michigan Academy of Arts, Sciences, and Letters Conference in 2017 and will present again in March this year. She hopes to one day be a professor so she can share her enthusiasm for architectural history with students. In the meantime, she'll continue her research as an independent scholar and lecture every opportunity she gets. So without further ado, I welcome Emily Matt. Thank you. Uh, is the mic working? We're good? I hope, okay. Um, so before I get started, I just wanna make sure that I let a few people know just how appreciative I am. Um, first, I wanna thank Dale Geyer for telling me that I'm not crazy to like architectural history as much as I do. Um, <laughs> and I wanna thank Philip Plowright and Martin Schwartz for pushing me to pursue the MARC thesis program um, because I didn't even know it was an option at the time. Um, so huge thank you to them. And then thank you to Deirdre Hannaberry um, for guiding me through my thesis with such patience. Um, all of you guys set me in motion to receive this honor. Um, and then a huge thank you to the Pellerin Fellowship Selection Committee for recognizing my work, granting this amazing opportunity. And then a fin final thank you to my fiance for putting up with me through all of this. <laughs> so. Uh, this is this lecture does count for AI continuing education credit. So here's the standard disclaimer. <laughs> and uh, here are four learning objectives if that's why you're here. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to get started by addressing the nature of research, and then I'll go into specifics of how my findings and perspectives have changed thanks to this experience. Since working on my research, I've done a lot of thinking about what research actually is. And going to Portugal and combining my previous research with these new experiences, so it's incredibly enlightening and humbling. When I was in the archives in Lisbon, turning page after page of Portuguese script from the 1700s, feeling like a detective as I found clues and new insights into the way the world worked in those places at those times, a story I'd heard in my childhood popped in my head an Indian parable that, went applied, that applied to my work, and it just clicked. And it goes something like this. Five blind men walk into a bar. I'm kidding, of course. Uh, five blind men come across an elephant for the first time, and none of them had any idea what an elephant was. The first one trips and falls and hits against the side of the elephant, and he, so he, his interpretation is that the elephant is a wall. The second man feels the elephant's trunk and thinks it's a snake. The third finds the elephant's leg and thinks the elephant is a tree trunk. The fourth felt the elephant's ear and thinks it's a fan. And the fifth touched the elephant's tail and thought the elephant was a rope. Now, all five men have valid experiences and observations, and they know, they're completely confident that they are correct because they made the observations themselves. But none of them can agree. They all observed very different things and have different interpretations. But you know, and I know, since we can see the elephant as a whole, all five men have these correct observations but incorrect conclusions. This, my friends, is how research works. You have to look at something from multiple perspectives to start to uncover the whole truth of it. The more perspectives you gain, the better your picture. So before I go into the impact of my trip, I want to establish the context for it. My travel proposal was for me to go to Portugal to further my master's thesis. The purpose of my thesis was to investigate the dissemination of Baroque architecture and cultural ideas from Portugal to, Bra to Brazil through the vehicle of colonization. In doing so, I contribute to the fields of architectural history, Iberian and uh, Iberian American Baroque, and colonial studies. Now, most US scholarly secondary resources imply that Brazilian Baroque is not distinct from Portuguese Baroque and is instead an extension of Portuguese Baroque. But these resources are from the 1930s to the 1960s. This reflects ad attitudes towards colonialism at the time, which have since shifted dramatically. So far as I could tell, the relationship between these two studies has not been studied, um, between these two styles has not been studied in around 60 years. Um, so the first part of my thesis was to establish that the two paths, the two styles actually do diverge. Um, so, the, and then the other part of my thesis is to, was to, just, to dig into just how Brazilian Baroque developed. 
I used a series of architectural characteristics as a metric to measure and note the dissemination uh, like of the different architecture and the different paths it took. Uh, and with this metric, I was able to gain a lens through which to understand and observe uh, Portuguese and Brazilian colonial contexts. So the characteristics I chose to be metrics of the dissemination are the octagonal nave, quadrature, or illusionistic painting, the two tower facade, azulejos, or tile work, and pilgrimage stairs. They were chosen because I did an inventory of each one in various churches in both Brazil and Portugal, and ensured that they all exist in some form in both places. Um, some observations in my thesis are on characteristics that remain on both continents, how some adapt, and how some disappear entirely over time. So with a variety of limited resources at my disposal, I was able to piece together quite a bit for my thesis, but the trip to Portugal opened up new resources. Uh, it opened up, uh, obviously, photographic resources. Uh, I no longer have to rely on bits and pieces captured by the casual traveler or incomplete digital archive. Uh, my fiance came with me on the trip to help me with photographic documentation. Between the two of us, we have over 7,000 photos and 100 360 degree photos. Um, so I've got quite a bit of content to keep me busy for a while. Um, also a value uh, to the research is the context of actually being in the areas to make observations in person. This has been crucial to gaining a better understanding of the relationship between architecture and the people who use it. I also was able to get a local perspective. Um, I've made invaluable connections to some of the people in the archive as well as a local fellow who works as a tour guide and has a particular interest in architecture because his father's an architect. So shout out to Nuno. Um, and then finally, I had the opportunity to go to the archive and do more archival research. I've been able to find some digital archival research and um, information supporting some of my statements um, or some of the things that I had found in secondary resources, but there were quite a few gaps and I wanted to make sure I understood um, exactly where they were getting this information from and in, in what context. So going to the archives allowed me to view non-digitized documents uh, to fill in those gaps. So exterior photos were fairly easy to come by because that's what most travelers do. They take pictures as they're passing by. But interior photos and site plans were far more difficult. Visiting each Portuguese church I had studied helped confirm some of the trends and conclusions that I had drawn, but there were definitely a few surprises. <coughs> One example that I show here is the São Vicente de Fora Monastery, and to my Brazilian friends that are watching, I apologize for my Portuguese. Um, I knew the exterior was Mannerist, and that it set the precedent for the two-tower facade trend in Portugal. Um, and then I also knew that the interior had been updated in the, with the Baroque azulejos and tiles in the 18th century. And for the record, that blue tile work is everywhere. Um, this is definitely, uh, the monastery has the most, I think, in any location in, in, uh, in, in Portugal. What I had not realized is that there was a quadrature painting in one of the rooms of the monastery. The Salve Sinti de Foro Monastery was the first place that I went to, and already I was uncovering information to potentially challenge some of my conclusions. For my original contextual research, I spent a good deal of time tracing when, where, and why architecture changed between 1550 and 1850. Using these characteristics was with digital and secondary resources and references, um, but even with the errors in character, character, ah, categorization uh, that I was discovering as I was going along in my journey, uh, the general trends that I found in my thesis were holding strong. The map here shows how I illustrated my, like the trends that I saw for my thesis. Over time in Portugal, Baroque moved north and evolved into Rococo. In Brazil, Baroque moved away from the coast and transitioned from Portuguese Baroque to Brazilian Baroque. Naturally, there are some overlapping techniques and design concepts, but due to differences in climate, resources, and culture, these styles inevitably diverge. Beyond these constraints, economic and natural events pushed these developments further apart. 
There are two major turning points in Brazil that trigger the development of Brazilian Baroque architecture. The failure of the sugar industry, followed by the discovery of gold, caused a migration of people and wealth to Brazil's interior. For Portugal, however, the architectural shift had to do with economics too, but far more to do with disaster. And it's one thing to read about something, but it's another to see it. Very few churches from Portugal's Baroque or earlier periods remain in Lisbon. So much of the Baroque elements seen in Lisbon are seen in altars or readables rather than decoration on the structure. So the example I show here is the igreja or church of Sahoki. The ceiling features a Baroque quadratura painting and some chapels are very, very Baroque with layers and layers of elaborately carved gilded wood while other chapels are neoclassical. So why does Lisbon have so much neoclassical architecture, but still have these splashes of Baroque? I had read before I went over there about the Lisbon earthquake of 1755, and I knew that much of the city was destroyed. I knew that the damage was extensive, and so much so that it was difficult to rebuild churches in the Baroque style, the expensive ornamentation was just prohibitive. So instead, much of the church architecture in Lisbon is considered neoclassical architecture after they rebuilt. It was much cheaper to have very simple ornamentation. This much I understood prior to my trip. And at the time, that, that for my thesis, that's all I needed to know. I just had a very basic understanding um, and then was able to compare it to what was going on in Brazil. I didn't allow myself the time to think of the implications. So seeing the odd assortment of Baroque pop up in different ways in churches that were not necessarily considered Baroque made me look back on the effects of the Lisbon earthquake when I came home. And for some further context, uh, the Brazilian gold and diamond booms occurred around 1700 to 1760. And Lisbon, as Portugal's capital and home of the crown, must have been booming. It's possible that Baroque buildings were everywhere. And I'm forced to say that this with uncertainty because existing records are limited. On November 1st, 1755, Lisbon was destroyed. And I'm not exaggerating, this illustration you see is not being melodramatic. Per modern standards, a magnitude nine earthquake hit off the coast of Lisbon. Lisbon's buildings were not designed to withstand tremors, so they didn't stand a chance. Once the shaking stopped, the devastation still continued. 40 minutes after the earthquake, the city was engulfed in water. The quake triggered a tsunami. First-hand accounts estimate that the first wave reached 20 feet high as it crashed into the city, and then was followed by two more waves. What wasn't destroyed by the quake and flooding was then destroyed by fire. Candles that had been lit for All Saints Day had fallen and started fires throughout the city. With the chaos of the other damage, it took three days to put out the fires. In the end, roughly 90% of Lisbon was destroyed, and 25% of the city's population was killed. <laughs> More than an effect on architecture, it had an effect on the psyche of the people of Lisbon. Per the teaching of, teachings of Catholicism at the time, natural disasters were God's response to sin, yet ironically, the city's red light district experienced comparatively little damage according to, <laughs> <laughs> according to um, famous Enlightenment philosopher Voltaire. So instead, on a holy day where the church is packed, and the church is crumbled. Some believe that the disaster was so traumatizing that it triggered the roots of modern atheism. A silver lining of this terrible, terrible event was a change in Lisbon's construction techniques. The city engineer developed new, more seismologically sound walls and designed wider grid-aligned streets, giving the city a sense of order that it had previously lacked. All of this additional research is in line with my previous research, and it confirmed that the earthquake does mark a definitive stylistic divergence in Lisbon's architectural development from that of North Portugal and Brazil. But it, it, it was very humbling to see the extent and understand the extent of it. But going back to my experiences there, Sahoki is among the few churches to have survived the earthquake relatively unscathed. So it is an interesting case study on the stylistic shift in Lisbon pre and post earthquake. The architecture acts like a series of snapshots capturing moments in history. Oops. Ah. So you can see 
there are two chapels shown here, one of them incredibly Baroque and the other one very neoclassical. And you can actually, they actually have signs there in the church stating the exact dates that they were built and it absolutely corresponds with before and after the earthquake. So next for contextual research, a different church. Um, the Church of Bon Jesus do Monte was just outside Braga um, and is just another example of where experiencing the space provides a completely new perspective. I'd read about pilgrimage stairs and resources describe the church as being at the top of a hill. Well, let me just say that's one heck of a hill. You start by going into Braga, getting on a bus, going down to the base of this hill, and then you go back and forth along a path in the woods where there are 20 chapels as the path of zigzags back and forth. And inside of each chapel, there are dioramas that are depicting various scenes from the Passion of Christ. The chapel's ages vary um, because it took a while to build each one. Um, and so they also have varying degrees of age and wear. The path is so long that before reaching the main stairs, there is an elevator, as they call it. It looks like a trolley that, that's up on the screen, uh, to bring you to the landing of the more famous and notable stairs. So once you make it through the forest of winding paths and chapels, you have these stairs. <laughs> I believe in total there are 577 steps between the forest and these stairs here. The photographs don't do it justice. <laughs> it was very sunny and it was a hot August day with no shade. There are statues at each landing as, as well as up the center and, and that was actually very merciful because um, I was able to chill out in the, the shade of a, a statue for a little while there. But um, what's interesting too is there are two stages of the stairs development. And it's a little hard to tell but towards the top near the church you can see that the slope of the stairs change. Um, and those are actually two different stylistic developments because they're built in two different time periods. Um, so the first segment has uh, statues that are featuring biblical figures and the second section has statues representing virtues. And I realized later that the statue that I was chilling in the shade of uh, was actually labeled Cari Caridade or charity. So I guess it was just meant to be. And when we got up to the top, there was a wedding going on inside of the church that was just wrapping up. And it was remarkably beautiful. Um, the architecture itself was in, just monumental and humbling, but they were also, there was a, a choir singing for the wedding. And the way it echoed around and the acoustics in that space after going up those really tiring stairs was an incredibly magical experience. Um, so, and to put it in perspective, pilgrims will take, traditionally would take the stairs by going on their knees. So if this is how I felt walking up them and entering the space, imagine how they must have felt. So I had started with some photographic and contextual understanding, which was improved upon by the trip, but the local perspective was a whole new resource. Different resources had shown me the same picture, which I show you here, and I reference in the map um, that I'd shown earlier, the same picture with different church names. Yet all of them related to the Carmelite Catholic Order. Some of the names are the Church of the Carmelite Third Order, Igreja do Carmo, Igreja do Carmelitas. Um, and I was incredibly confused because we're, we're talking different published books showing the same picture with different names. Um, so I ended up going onto Google Maps and thinking, okay, this is gonna help me, right? And I type it in and it points to it in Porto and I look at the street view and it was, that was the church, great. So I thought I found it. I'm like, well, where's this other one? So I searched that and it pointed to the same spot. So <laughs> that was incredibly confusing um, and it wasn't something that I could continue to pursue investi investigation of uh, during my thesis but it was great to be able to revisit this when I was there. So my tour guide friend explained the situation to me. The left side, the Igreja dos Carmelitas, was built in the mid 17th century in a Baroque style with touches of classical influences. The story goes as follows. 
the Iglesia dos Carmelitas was making some pretty good money from pilgrimage traffic. So a guy decided that he would be allowed, or that he, oh wait, sorry, let me step back. So a guy decided to ask the church that if he could be allowed to build a hospital next door to support the pilgrims, you know, expand on the business. Church leaders agreed. So then the guy requested that he be allowed to add a chapel to the hospital. Okay, seems reasonable. So then the guy builds this giant chapel next door, which is clearly a church, and the church leaders were furious. <laughs> but it was already built, so what are you gonna do? Unfortunately, palpable laws prevent two churches from being so close together with nothing in between. So what do they do? That skinny section that you see right there is a house. <laughs> <laughs> So there you have it. My unusual research obstacle was due to an unusual situation and Eureka, I solved it. <laughs> so the interiors of the churches couldn't be more different. The one on the right was a surprise to me because every time I looked up the, the different names, it always ended up referring to the church on the left. Uh, apparently I wasn't the only one confused. So they kept labeling things incorrectly. Um, and this kind of confusion isn't a one-time issue either. For the record, because I ran into trouble a lot of times, especially going between Portugal and Brazil, where churches would have the same exact name but be in a different location. So, and, and Google is not always helpful. You can search for one name, and if it's not a very common church, it's gonna show you the other one. So, sometimes you would just do a casual search and it just gives the wrong results. So it was really nice to actually go to the location and put all of these you know, unusual situations and questions to rest. And then finally, Igreja de São Cristóvão. All of the previous examples show churches that had been restored, presumably to their former glory. For anyone that has studied theories behind historic re restoration, you'll know what I mean. It's relatively impossible to really know what the former glory really is. Or since, since things have changed over time, what stage should be considered at its glory. When we found this church by accident, um, we had been looking for a place to eat and we saw the two trademark towers peeking above the, the houses and we decided to go check it out. It wasn't on my list, I actually did not know this church existed. Um, and what was nice is when I went in, it was almost refreshing because nothing had been done to it. Um, it had a, a realness to it, without modern lighting, without everything being touched up, and it it's a different kind of snapshot in time. It holds a completely different value from the churches that had already been restored. And it was nice too because there was a little old lady sitting at the front. I was able to talk to her about, you know, what was going on with the church restoration and um, I asked her how she felt about it. And she said, although she loves her church as the way it is, uh, she hopes that the restoration efforts will ensure that her dear church will get more traffic and remain for future generations. So the final new resource I'm gonna to discuss today is the textual research I got from the archive in Lisbon. Many of my secondary resources, both in English and in Portuguese, refer to specific documents addressing the start of the Brazilian gold rush and the establishment of the resulting mining towns. The risk with secondary resources is that the primary resource has been viewed through the author's filter. This is particularly relevant because as I mentioned earlier, many of the resources written in English had outdated biases. That's not to say you should assume all authors are wrong, but all authors have a filter that is linked to their time, place, and culture, and so forth. Even my writing will have some sort of bias that's just inevitable. But in theory, I'm hoping to produce research that synthesizes the existing research um, with the research that I'm doing in a way that's useful for future researchers. So anyway, the, the Torre de Tombo archive in Lisbon um, was a wonderful research. They were very patient with me as my uh, rusty Portuguese, I, I wrote to them ahead of time to make sure that I was making the most of my trip. I was able to request documents ahead of time and have them pulled from the archive. Um, a lot of documents have been digitized, they're modernizing their library, but there are a few th catalog entries that looked very promising related to mining that have not been digitized. So th those are what I was able to study when I was there. Um, so I combed through these really old books 
um, and further the, the texture of the pages. It's just if you have the opportunity to go to an archive and actually research and dig in, especially something that you actually care about, let's do it. Like it's it's a little intimidating to learn a new system, but it's such an incredible experience. Um, so as I come through the books, I had some hits and misses in terms of you know some entries were perfect and exactly what I needed, and other ones were a total not worth my time. Um, so I probably come through about a thousand pages of, of Portuguese scribbly text, um, and I now have about 200 pages to work with that uh, has potentially relevant information. Uh, I was able to request that they scan the pages themselves, so now I have a digital version of it. This is one example page that I'm using to dig deeper into the relationship between the Portuguese crown and the Brazilian gold rush. At a glance, I could read roughly, whoever discovers gold in River Caudal can keep part of the money. Um, but I reached out to a Brazilian friend of mine, and she was able to help me translate a little further, because the script gets a little stuck together for a while there. Um, and she confirmed that my interpretation was correct, but additionally, um, whoever found the gold in the river must give a certain amount of money to the administration, but he was partial owner of the mine. Now, can you imagine being given that offer? Whoever finds the mine gets the mine. No wonder there's a gold rush. So folks, I have tons of new perspectives on my research and on the relationship between people and their places. This experience has launched me forward. The architecture in Portugal, much more so than Brazil, has layers and layers of history where much older churches were updated as the style shifted. And it's like this monumental church of San Francisco. It's a Gothic cathedral, but when you go inside, you get this. It's definitely not what you would expect from a Gothic cathedral. Um, and I was aware that it had been updated, but I didn't expect this. Um, it was absolutely dumbfounding. You walk in, and because it's a Gothic cathedral, you still have that cool um, feeling from all the stone where it's like literally colder in there, but then there's the warmth of the gold everywhere. And then I also want to take a moment to appreciate this gorgeous sculpture of a Jesse tree. This was also in there, and it's probably one of the most stunning sculptures I've ever seen. This is not directly related to anything. It's just really pretty. Um, <laughs> So thanks to these layers and layers of history, plus the discoveries I made during uh, and as a result of this trip, I'm well aware that there's much to learn and discover. But thanks to this experience, my elephant is looking much better than it did from my thesis research. And that said, I'm still pretty sure my elephant is missing a leg. <laughs> Thank you. So does anyone have any questions? Yes, and we have to use this for the people who are dying with us. All your friends in Brazil. I know, right? <laughs> so after your research, um, given the knowledge that you discovered with the uh, earthquake, do you think the people of Portugal would have embraced neoclassical without the earthquake? Or do you think natural events um, propelled them forward? It's a little of both. What I would guess, because of trends that I've seen in other countries and other areas of Portugal, is um, it wouldn't have been so stark. When you're walking around Lisbon, there's not much uh, like Baroque and Rococo architecture, whereas when you go to the north, it's like everywhere. Everything's Rococo. So they just kind of cut fresh and you know, had a fresh start, whereas you know you go to Porto, there's going to be a couple neoclassical, some Baroque, and so there's this mixture that Lisbon lacks. So would they have done it? Probably. But it wouldn't have been exclusive. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? I'll ask one if no one else does. Thank you, Emily. This is great. Um, first, a comment and then a question. First, your very first statement, or one of the earliest statements you made, about how the text currently written linking the Baroque architecture in Portugal and Brazil are incredibly biased towards kind of a colonial position. And uh, I think that's 
for me, one of the most significant things you said, and it seems like such a rich area to mine from a research uh, perspective. And, and, and I'm sure you're aware, but a lot of people listening, there's a, a complete kind of relook based on how we used to think of things, particularly in areas of, of craft, which is related to the Baroque and how it's built and how we position um, our understanding of the world not as a colonialist view, but as a global view. So I think it's really, really important. But uh, that leads to a bit of a question. And in so many uh, transitions or uh, colonizations that move across the ocean, you see a huge change in how they interpret architecture. So neoclassical in Massachusetts was very different than neoclassical in New Orleans. And so I guess my question would be, because of the environment, it's just a completely different uh, temperature, humidity, et cetera. Did you see a huge change for any obvious environmental reasons in that architecture, in terms of materials available and weather and other things when you moved from Portugal to Brazil? Absolutely. Um, in Portugal, they have a lot more ac like access to stone, and so you'll see a lot more masonry work. Whereas in Brazil, they don't have the same kind of stone mine, so they did a lot more with wood and plaster. Um, and so for my thesis, one of the arguments that I had was there was a church in Salvador, or Salvador that um, was completely imported from Portugal. It was like it was prefabricated and brought over, and it's one of the only seriously monumental churches in in Brazil. Um, and I kind of view that as like a turning point because there were no other ones. So what did they do with that design, and how did they take inspiration from it, but then make it their own? So absolutely, I saw a difference um, in materiality um, just from the location. So I think the. Um interdisciplinary nature of your investigation is so interesting, especially when you start talking about uh, the discovery of other um, precious uh, extraction materials, like gold. It's like, so in Brazil then, you, you notice the transition away from the coast inland, uh, basically chasing the gold. So did you see or do you sense that the church architecture took on a new role in terms of um, expressing national or power identity uh, and it was used for more propagandistic purposes? Because you imagine a, like gold fields that you're going to draw lots of people from different places. And so were the churches drawn into, um, I guess, a, a new role of symbolism? So it wasn't exactly about power from what I can tell, but I, I definitely saw a difference in the ornamentation. So I had mentioned in this presentation the quadrature ceilings, and that's actually one of the really important traits that was brought from Lisbon and Porto to Brazil. Um, and one of the ways that Brazilians made it their own was one of the designs is almost exactly like one of the churches in Lisbon in terms of like the configuration and the layout, but it instead it features like instead of a, a, a European or typically white um, like uh, Virgin Mary in the center, it's actually a mulatto or mixed uh, Virgin Mary. So that's one of the most distinct things that I've seen so far that is a, a really strong transition in a proclamation of identity. So uh, in Brazil, did you notice a difference in the shift toward neoclassical that was um, not only different from Lisbon, but from other parts of Portugal as far as timing? It was different. Um, it definitely came over, but at a different rate. Um, and it kind of gave an opportunity for the Brazilians to develop their own Baroque. Um, Additionally, in the area of the gold mines, that's when they played, that's where they played with it the most. That's where there was the most wealth. So even though they were supposed to give a bunch of money to the crown, of course they're going to keep some for, them, for themselves. And they ended up reinvesting it in, the, in their communities. Um, oh, where was I going with this? So what was the second part of your question, if you don't mind? Uh, whether it was a, a different timeline, I guess? Timeline, yeah. yes. So what I noticed is that the interior um, of Brazil where Baroque like flourished didn't see as much neoclassical development, but other areas absolutely did. So wherever it was like the hottest part um, of the development stayed, but everything else was a little more relaxed and less dedicated to the Baroque. 
And I, I wonder, sort of like Margaret did, whether uh, because they had the gold, the architecture necessarily was just more flashy. Is that? <laughs> it's, it's definitely related. Um, but uh, I know that part of it was, it was in terms of identity, to go back to what Margaret was saying uh, or asking about, um, I know that when you ever, whenever you have a gold rush, it's usually the less savory people. So you had a lot of criminals and ranchers that didn't want to be ranchers anymore, and um, sometimes there were um, even a, a, some like freed or escaped slaves that just didn't want to be in the city anymore and just wanted you know to have their own independent wealth. Um, all of them came together and formed these communities that were far less European than other areas. Okay, um, so what exactly like sparked your initial interest in doing Baroque versus other styles? And then also kind of going to a fun question, after all of your research and like 7,000 photos, um, what kind of church would you ideally build if you had the opportunity? <laughs> Okay, so <coughs> why Baroque? Um, I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, or it was addressed in my introduction, I can't remember. Um, I actually got to live in Brazil for three years. Mm -hmm. And in that time, I was able to travel to some different states and see the different architecture. Um, but there, was, there were two churches. One of them was the church that was imported um, from Portugal to Brazil, and it was very impressive. And then another one was mostly plaster, but it had it was just cram packed with this gilded, like gold plated wood. Um, and I remember thinking, and this is just me back in high school, not really knowing this much about architecture, but how the heck did this get here? <laughs> and so ever since then, I always ended up pursuing more information about it, and the more I learned, the more I wanted to learn. Um, and so that's just kind of how it started from there. Uh, and then in terms of what church would I build? Um, ironically, Baroque has never been my favorite, but <laughs> I know, because Baroque and Rococo seems overdone, you know, but it has a place, it has a purpose, and so that's why I like studying it, it's all part of the story. Um, so any church that I would build is probably going to be fairly simple, but with some touches of elegance based on the road. Because I, I like the details, I like the, the natural motifs, but not so much of it. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Well, I think that uh, if you have any other questions, we can maybe save them for the reception in the Brick Gallery of the old uh, architecture building afterwards. So first, I want to thank Emily for a wonderful presentation. <laughs> And now let's see if I can do Tolerant Fellowship, which is so graciously provided by our alums, is, uh, as I said, a traveling fellowship, which is dedicated towards giving students the opportunity to follow their passion and, and actually see architecture in practice. And the way that we determine the winner is that uh, every year we ask the graduate faculty to give us a list of potential nominees from among their exceptional students. And these nominees have to have uh, taken and passed either Advanced Design Studio 1 and 2 or their master's thesis in the previous year. And so from that group, we get together with, uh, there's a group of alums and me from the architecture department, and we look at those, that group is invited to make a submission for the award, and we review the submissions and select a winner every year. And it's $3,000, so it's not bad whatsoever. And if I can finish this, hang on. Now I just need to connect here. There's one at all. Yeah. <laughs> I, I tested this beforehand, and of course, now we've got a problem. There it is. Now, let's go here. All right, so this may or may not work. Anyway, it's a list of names. And I'm happy to say that the following people were nominated for the Pellerin Fellowship for 2018. Joshua Bremer, Sylvia Brunoni, 
Brianna Campbell, Eric Knaus, Drew Mittig, Corbin Patton, and Travis Pennock. And from that list, the committee selected the 2018 Pellerin Fellowship winner, Eric Knaus. back next year and Eric will be giving this lecture and we're all anxious to see where he will go and what he will do. So as I said thank you very much for coming. Uh, we're going to move to the Brick Gallery now for a reception where you can get some refreshments, meet Emily, ask further questions and see posters that relate to her work. So thank you for coming and we'll see you over there.